um, with regard to what we've got coming up in um, in terms of the in person uh, contact hours, lab hours. So uh, at the top of the course page, under announcements, you'll see two new um, links that have been added to the page. The first one says Lucy Brock lab hours sign up sheet. And sorry about that. Can you guys see that now? Okay, so it's broken down by classroom and you can see you've got options of Lucy Brock infant toddler one or two Lucy Brock preschool. Those are all the on campus sites and then the other uh, places are off campus NC pre K classrooms that are operated by Lucy Brock. And I do just want to call your attention to the fact that we've got let's see one, two, three, six weeks on the table for all of the on campus sites but the public schools are closed on that sixth week the week of april 18th i believe so plan accordingly um if you know that you for whatever reason like need to do contact hours during that week of april 18th the spots are going to be more limited so i'm just letting you know um so that you can go ahead and kind of plug yourself in where appropriate um do as i said try to space these out um but you know if you have to catch two in the same week or something like that that's not gonna you're not gonna be penalized for that i just think that you will be in a better position to do your personal reflection and writing on what you saw if you're able to spread them out you know with just kind of doing one um, per week would be ideal uh, so this document is available to you all. It's shared so that you can edit it. And if you will, over the next couple of weeks, just go ahead and plug yourself in with four time slots that work for your schedule. Any questions on this? Can you remind us the amount of lab hours you're requiring us for? So you're, you're supposed to do four two hour time slots and those correlate with four lab participation reflections. Um, and if you'll recall, I did say last time we met that if you are already scheduled to be at Lucy Brock for other classes in other time slots, you don't have to do um, double duty here. So, but, but you do need to meet that minimum requirement of four two hour time slots in the classroom. Any other questions? Um, are we going inside of the classrooms or are we in the booths for this observation? You are going inside of the classroom. And that's why um, that kind of brings me to my next point that Andrea, the director of all of these classrooms will be coming to our meeting next week to talk about you know, things you need to know, kind of the logistics piece of it. So make sure that you're here for that conversation. She will kick us off about 1230 next week. So um, if you do have specific questions about you know, access to the classroom or, and she'll talk you through kind of what the expectations for your presence in the space are as well. Does that make sense? Um, I have a question about the times. Also, like if something, if we go ahead and sign up for our four time slots, yes. um, something comes up like with a class or something like that, can we just reschedule it to a different day? You can. Um, the only thing is, and so if there's like enough of a, like if it's within a week or so of, and Andrea may speak to this, this is probably a specific question that we should ask her. Um, I, I just know from personal experience being a teacher there, the staff very much need to know who to expect on a given day. So if it's like the day of, you need to make direct contact, I would assume with Andrea or with some, some other staff point person to say that you're not gonna be there. Um, but if it's like a week or so out, you can just modify the sign up sheet and move yourself around accordingly. I can't imagine that they keep up with it more than like week to week um, in that way. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I'm, I'm going to make myself a note that we need to get kind of specific guidance on that because I don't know exactly what the expectations are anymore. Any other questions on the in-class participation piece? Um, yeah, one more question. <clears throat> I'm getting ready to go to Lucy Brock this Friday. Um, I noticed like your sign up sheet only has it for like March. Um, is that okay if I start like observing this Friday for you or do I need to have like my name in an actual slot for that? Um, if you have already, have you been in Lucy Brock before or been oriented to what you're doing while you're there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you've got those bases covered, I'm okay with you going ahead and, and working ahead on this assignment. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Anybody else? Okay, so to go along with this, there's also the Lucy Brock confidentiality agreement form. Um, I'm, you guys are seeing my screen. So it's posted right here under the lab sign up sheet and it will take you to, well, if I had it open, um, it takes you to a live like Google Doc share form that you can read through the expectations around confidentiality. There is an expectation that everyone signs this form if they're going to be having contact in the classrooms. It outlines what are your ethical responsibilities with regard to keeping children and families information private. Um, and then you will sign off accordingly. I do think that Andrea sort of speaks to this um, when she comes to, to talk with us, but you can go ahead and fill this out and then you will kind of get information about it after the fact. Um, but it's pretty straightforward if you read what you're signing. And that does have to be in place before you can go into the classroom. And then if, if for some reason you missed this information last week, the assignment guidance for the lab participation reflections are posted right under what I just went over. Um, it's for assignments and you can look over those on your own time. But make sure you know kind of what you're looking for um, across the board, because remember we said you may not see something one time that you see another time. And so you might have to kind of shuffle those around um, according to what what you observe. So be aware of what those four look like. All righty. Uh, we may have more questions that kind of come up after next week and then we'll kind of field those as we go. And before we get into today's content, I'm just going to remind everyone midterm is coming up um, Thursday. That's the asynchronous content. There is a midterm exam review sheet just to give you a little bit of guidance with regard to kind of big topics um, and things like that that you should know. If you've been to class and kept up with your reading, you will be fine. Um, but please be aware that you have a two hour time block to complete the midterm and you cannot stop and start. So you need to carve out a chunk of time for yourself Thursday. It will be open all day from 8 a.m. until midnight. So you have um, any time within that window to work on your midterm exam. And then we have one more week before spring break. Ah. Um, and it's kind of all downhill from there. You know, I feel like things start kind of snowballing and summer will be here before you know it. Has anyone put their chacos on yet this week? It's, it's kind of, yes, it's like Chaco weather outside. My, my children were running around yesterday in short sleeve dresses with no shoes on. And I was like, only in Boone do we come out of hibernation in mid-February and start going barefoot because it's like 50 degrees. <laughs> um, but it's good. It's refreshing. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now to talking about the PowerPoint unless anyone has burning needs. Okay, we are kind of shifting our focus from we've been talking about indirect guidance up to this point. We've talked about environments, time, energy allocation, all of those indirect guidance concepts. Um, and today we're going to focus on direct guidance. So this is at the top of the pyramid, right? After we've got those foundational pieces in place, this is the stuff that comes in when you have specific 
challenging behaviors or maybe a child who's just not you know um, performing the the task of the classroom routine or whatever the case may be this is where we come in and we give very clear verbal or sometimes even physical direction and guidance to get children um, to follow along with what's being expected of them <clears throat> we will talk today about um, what direct guidance is specifically different types we're going to talk about affective guidance and then break down different components and techniques related to both physical and verbal guidance so we've talked about this before that being physically close or physical nearness and showing interest in a child's work or their play uh, can help children sustain their own interest in their learning activities. We also know that children are more likely to follow classroom rules uh, when they have your attention, right? Because they already have your attention, so they don't have to act out or engage in sometimes, you know, boisterous attention seeking behavior. They already have your attention because you're in close proximity to them. But beyond being just close to children, sometimes we have to use direct contact. And this can look like modeling a behavior, leading the child with, you know, like hand over hand type of guidance. Sometimes we have to restrain children when their bodies are completely out of control. And then we're gonna also talk about removing children appropriately from situations that are causing conflict or upset in the classroom. Uh, these types of physical guidance can be particularly effective for children who maybe are English language learners or dual language learners, uh, because they can understand physical guidance and gestures more easily than they might understand spoken word verbal guidance. Um, there might also be children with atypical patterns of development that respond better to um, this type of modeling or you know hand over hand guidance rather than verbal direction because of cognitive processing we're going to talk about these strategies more in detail um, but i just want to point out that sometimes there's a space for these even outside of really challenging behaviors <clears throat> when we think about physical guidance strategies it's really important to consider individuality just like with anything with young children so all children are different, their needs are different, um, their you know, abilities to perform the task are different based on age and development, typical development or um, children with disabilities. And so we have to individualize our physical guidance just like we would individualize our instruction to young children. We can help children learn new skills through physical guidance, particularly that idea of modeling or demonstrating um, I think about like scissor skills when I mention this, you know, sometimes just the idea of putting your hand in the holes with the child and, and showing them how to use the scissors. Sometimes that's all it takes and then they can take that and run with it. Um, but that's kind of what we mean when we say um, modeling or demonstrating hand over hand. Uh, that's a good kind of visual to think about. And then obviously as children grow and develop, become more independent, more confident, we typically see a decrease in physical guidance as, as being needed. Um, we do less of that hand over hand and demonstrating and we can usually rely more on verbal guidance um, as children are you know, getting older. <clears throat> so I've, I've given you some examples of this with uh, scissors. Other ideas you might see hand washing, um, teachers modeling, especially now that we have such strict protocol. We've always had that in early childhood, but I guess it's become you know increasingly important that we're modeling and showing children the proper way to wash hands. Toothbrushing is another one of those skills that you might see a teacher helping a child physically with. Um, when we think about meal times, self-help skills, you know, helping a child putting your hands on top of their hands to help them pull their pants up or to pour their milk when they're serving their food. Um, all of those are examples of these demonstrating and modeling 
physical guidance strategies. Um, one that we might not think of as obviously is suggesting that children watch a more experienced peer. But this is one of the benefits of the multi-age classroom that you can draw on if you're in that setting is that, um, you know, typically the preschool classroom is comprised of three to five year olds or so. And five year olds have a, a whole myriad of skill sets that three year olds don't have. So if you have a three year old who's struggling with a zipper or shoe tying or any of those things, um, sometimes it's even more effective than you as the adult trying to teach the child to just say, hey, you know, Carson's gotten really good at doing zippers. Why don't we go over there and watch him do his and see if he can help you learn how to do yours or something along those lines. But it's the same principle. It's demonstrating and modeling or having the child try to um, imitate that, that from a peer. So that's also a physical guidance strategy. Another one is leading. This is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's taking a child you know, by the hand or gently by the shoulder, even a hand on the back to sort of physically guide them in the direction that you want them to be going. So if we're outside, we're trying to get you know, small groups of children um, to come in and use the toilet, I might go over to the fence and have you know, two children that I take by the hand and I just physically lead them inside. Of course, I'm telling them where we're going and what we're doing. I've probably already given them a transition cue like we talked about last time so that they are not surprised by what I'm doing. Um, but this is just, you know, it helps get the child's attention and, and sort of orient them towards what you're asking them to do. Um, sometimes it can be in the classroom just as simple as turning a child's shoulders. You know, if you want them to clean up their lunch dishes, they're standing at the table talking to, to peers, you just simply come over and, you know, help them see this is where I want you to go with your dishes. And you're just very gently leading them in the right direction. We do need to be careful to follow children's cues with regard to this idea because some children find hand holding to be comfortable, you know, it's like a, a sense of security. Um, but other children, particularly like in that toddler age range where we hear them saying, you know, no, mind me, I do it. Um, they might not want to hold your hand. They might want to be very independent in this. And so you don't want it to become a power struggle. Um, there are other guidance strategies that you can employ. But if hand holding works, you know, it's a pretty simple, um, straightforward way to get the child to follow with what you're asking them to do. <clears throat> so I mentioned at the beginning that sometimes restraint is necessary. Times when I would say that it's necessary is when we are having to protect either the child in question or other children and or sometimes the space, you know, children, um, they're not known for their impulse control, right? They're developing that. And so um, at times they do become out of control and exhibit behaviors that are unsafe either to themselves, to others or to the environment. And in that situation, it would be appropriate to gently restrain the child in order to keep them safe. Um, and so I have a little video clip here. This one is not pretty. <laughs> I will just start by saying that, and it doesn't last very long, but I think this is a really clear example of how to appropriately use restraint if you have to. This child is clearly outside of the building and you know close to the road or the parking lot. And so this is really born out of a concern for the child's safety. Um, but it's also paired with, and this is what I want you to notice, verbal guidance. She gives very um, clear kind of parameters and lets him know when she's going to pick him up if he doesn't comply with her request to get off the ground. Um, so just watch this for a couple of minutes and um, we'll follow up after. Can you hear that okay? All 
All right. Thoughts and ideas. I feel like I would have just forgot the books and just asked someone else to just bring the books with me, but yeah. 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 I think honestly, if I was going to give constructive criticism, um, which, you know, we sometimes we are doing the best we can with what we've got. And she's the only person with this child. She does have her hands full. Um, but yeah, I would, I would have probably in an ideal world, we would have set the books down on the, on the sidewalk. And that way we wouldn't have seen that, you know, the one armed pull, which doesn't look very comfortable for either the child or the caregiver. Um, and, and she could have picked him up in maybe a safer way from the get go. Um, that, that would, that's a good point, I think, to, to make. And she did that once she got inside safely, you know, with the books, put the books down and, and restrain the child um, with both hands. But yeah, I think that would probably have been the best approach for sure. Um, but you could clearly see in this video, right, that she, um, it was born out of necessity. And then she said to him, okay, I'm going to count down from 10. And if you haven't come with me, you know, I'm going to pick you up and take you inside. Um, and so it wasn't coming out, out of the blue. It wasn't coming out of her being super frustrated that he wasn't listening. It was just a matter of fact, this is what we have to do because we're not safe out here and I have to get you inside. <clears throat> Any questions on, or I, someone going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the fact that I think something I noticed is that even though like he was flailing when she walked in the room, there was also like the spatial awareness to recognize that like he was sort of headed for the chair mm -hmm. with his body um, and to move him from that. Um, so that even though there was necessary restraint, there was also an awareness that like he could, you know, hit the chair and hurt his arm or hit the sure. chair and hurt his head. And so I just thought it was uh, like well thought out that she was aware of that space and even in the restraint. Um, yeah. wanted to protect him from that yeah absolutely um and you know i don't know what her like what the classroom situation is looking like um but that chair presents kind of an opportunity if we knew that our classroom was well staffed and we had an extra couple of minutes to just sit down with this child and try not in a restraining way, but just out of like a comfort way, you know, to sit with him and hold him and maybe get him settled before we keep going into the classroom. Because what, you know, it's, it could, sometimes a shift in environment can help kind of reorient a child and get them calmed down. But sometimes it's better um, to calm them down before you take them back into the classroom with the large group. And again, that's that kind of individualization piece where if we know this child or we know how the classroom kind of temperature is that day, we might make a decision based on that. But yes, I think being mindful of the environment, as you point out, for safety concerns, and then also kind of capitalizing on the environment in a way that might help you um, minimize or you know settle this situation down um, is also an idea. Anybody else got thoughts on this? <coughs> it ain't pretty, right? <laughs> None of us ever want to, to, and it doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel good to the caregiver um, or the child, you know, I'm sure, but um, it, it is sometimes just, a part of the work for sure. Um, so the other guidance strategy that is specifically a physical guidance strategy that we'll talk about is removing. Um, and I want to be really careful that we don't get this confused with taking a child to time out because it's not the same thing. But I always told my staff at my center and parents as well, um, just because we have a policy that we don't use timeout in our classroom does not mean that we don't have sometimes opportunities where we need to either remove a child from a situation or remove, you know, materials kind of remove the situation from the child. Um, they're not the same thing. And so when we think about removing, the idea here is that we are taking the child somewhere away from the upset to get calmed down and regain composure. And what's important between the, the distinction, I think, between you know, time away, removing a child, and time out is that the teacher is 
providing support to the child in this removal situation. So it looks like taking a child, you know, to a different space in the classroom. Most classrooms have a safe place or a quiet area or something like that where they can go um, and, you know, look at maybe this, the child in this picture is surrounded by conscious discipline materials where it talks to you about, you know, what are your feelings in that moment? How can you calm down and regain your composure? Those cards on the wall are teaching the child how to do specific breathing techniques. And so all of that, you know, can kind of be built into the environment to help the child manage themselves once they have been, you know, taken to or asked to go to this um, place to calm down. The difference, I think, philosophically in putting a child in timeout is that, you know, basically the idea of timeout is sit down and think about what you did wrong for however long I tell you to sit there and think about it or whatever. And we know that children likely are not doing that um, while they're in timeout because they don't have that skill set yet, you know, um, but there that's more of kind of a, a punishment approach where this is intended to help the child regulate. And so it's really a difference in how we're approaching um, the strategy. And brief timeout, just to kind of give you this information, uh, sometimes in the special education world, you will hear that terminology, brief timeout, and that is basically this idea of removing um, a toy for 10 to 30 seconds or removing a stimulus from a child. And it's really about um, principles of reinforcement. And so sometimes in the special education realm with children with specific atypical patterns of development, that concept of brief timeout from materials or from a situation is used to help them learn. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to mention that in case you hear that terminology. A couple more physical guidance strategies include gesturing and body language. Um, and so again, you know, we talked about gesturing kind of as it relates to dual language learners or children with unusual um, or atypical patterns of development, this can help children who might have a language barrier. Um, and then body language, you know, I think we all communicate with body language without even realizing it. And so this is how we show um, our emotional connection to children. We show interest, um, approval of their behavior, sometimes through our body language, through our facial expressions. Um, and, and that can all be considered a type of physical guidance as well. Um, the flip side of that is like the, I see what you're doing and I'd like you to stop it. <laughs> you know, um, you can also guide behavior by the opposite of, of a, um, smiling face. Um, and that would be considered physical guidance as well. So verbal guidance. This obviously involves using words to influence the child's behavior. Um, we are talking about communicating our expectations for children's behavior, as well as when we approve or disapprove of what they do. This also encompasses the idea of talking through rules um, and explaining consequences to children. That's all a part of verbal guidance. Um, and we're gonna talk about rulemaking here in just a bit. Um, but I wanna point out that verbal guidance also includes listening to children. So it's not just talking to them or talking at them, um, but it's also about listening to them and getting their feedback on different situations. <clears throat> so we want to listen carefully and with empathy to children. Uh, I think we've already talked in here about reflective listening and active listening as concepts related to communication with families, but this can also apply to our work with young children, especially when we think about um, kind of helping children and giving language to the child's experience, you know? So if you notice, um, or the child, you know, a toddler is, is using verbalizations and um, emerging language to 
try to communicate, you know, frustration or upset with something that's just happened in the classroom, a way to actively or reflectively listen to them would be to kind of help put language behind what they're sharing with you. So, oh yeah, so-and-so tried to take whatever you're playing with and that didn't feel good to you. Now you're frustrated. That's that idea of reflective or active listening um, applied to young children. When we talk to children, and I know we've mentioned this before, um, a natural and I think respectful tone of voice is really, really important. So we talk to children the way that we want other adults to talk to us. Um, we talk in our normal voice. I am a big advocate of using normal language, um, you know, vocabulary words that children maybe don't have um, as a way to kind of further their language development. But we don't talk to them in a condescending or, um, you know, derogatory way. Um, we want to just talk to them like they're people, just like us, because they are. <laughs> Um, and then eye contact is also important. And so the only way to make eye, well, it's not the only way, but the best way to make eye contact with a child when you're talking to them is to bring your body down to their level so that you can be face to face with them and your eyes are on the same level. If we stand over children and talk down at them, there's kind of like a power over dynamic there that sometimes feels uncomfortable to children. And um, it just kind of, limits the level of engagement, I think, and and the respect that we're trying to communicate. So always getting down on their level, making eye contact. Um, and then uh, pet peeve that I see all the time, um, because early childhood settings are naturally loud. And so in order to be heard, sometimes people just get louder, you know? Um, and that's where I, I kind of have a policy at my center where I would say, you know, if you've said something twice and you haven't gotten the child's attention, there's a, that's, you've tried verbal guidance and now it's time for some physical guidance. So you have to be responsible to move yourself closer to the child. Um, and then that physical proximity sometimes is all you need to get their attention. And then you can say your words again. Um, but if that hasn't worked after three tries of verbal, then it's time to, like I said, you know, shift the child into the direction of what you want them to be doing, take them by the hand and lead them some other tactic, you know, because otherwise you're just kind of repeating yourself like a broken record and clearly no one's listening. <laughs> Um, but yelling across the room or getting louder to get the child's attention is really ineffective, really ineffective. Um, and it just contributes to like a chaotic feel in the classroom. So specific strategies for verbal guidance outside of listening and eye contact include speaking in really short, clear sentences. Uh, we want, you know, super direct phrases that tell the child how to be successful um, with the toddler you know in the example that I gave a few minutes ago where someone tried to take something you could encourage the child to say my turn tell them my turn you know um, but that's like a two-word phrase that I'm expecting the child to repeat and they're you don't want to say well you need to tell Susie that it's happy that you're having your turn with the ball and she can wait I mean there's a place for that maybe, but not when we're trying to guide a child's behavior. If we want them to be able to accomplish the task of indicating that it's their turn, it has to be short and sweet, like say my turn. <clears throat> um, we've talked, I think in here already about positive directions. And so this is teaching the child what we want them to do versus what we want them to stop doing. Um, I think that our human brains are just wired in a way in which we hear directives better than we hear no stop and don't. We just kind of tend, and maybe it's just because of our um, exposure to those words, but children typically don't listen when you say no stop don't as well as they listen when you say please do this or um, go over there and, you know, so we want to give clear positive directions that tell them what to do. Um, and then action clauses first. So if we can think to put the verb in front or the action, that helps the child um, process more quickly what they're supposed to do. So an example would be hold my hand 
as we cross the street. Hold my hand. That's the directive that you want. If you go about it this way, we're about to cross the street, so I need you to hold my hand. The child is thinking like cross the street, you know, and you've kind of missed that window of hold my hand. We're about to cross the street. Um, it, it helps if you give the action first. And then um, we, we understand that children, very young children can follow one step directions. That's like a toddler expectation. And then around three, we would hope that children can follow a two step direction. Um, and as they grow through the preschool age group, we might get to multi step directions. Again, very individualized by child. But if you tell a toddler, go over to the sink, wash your hands, get a paper towel, put your paper towel in the trash and go to the road for group. Like I'm already confused, you know, that's way too much information. So you just have to do it one, maybe two steps at a time um, in terms of giving those directions. Um, but multi-step directions are for much older children. <clears throat> um, and then just kind of a basic note, and this sort of relates to the readings that I hope you did on praise and using praise and kind of the verbal environment. But um, competition among children in the classroom, like, you know, let's see who can do this the fastest or whatever. It's not the most effective way, you know, um, sometimes it can be a playful um, approach to, to managing something, but typically um, we want to avoid motivating children with competition against one another or even against themselves. Um, and we just want to give straightforward directions and expectations for behavior. Any questions on verbal guidance so far? All right, so on this next slide, the idea here is about giving choice. We want to give children as much choice as possible because if you remember from last time when we talked about environments, children need to feel a sense of control and autonomy in their space, in their day, etc. So I've given you four examples here. We're looking at cleaning up from, let's say, mealtime, as you see in the picture, getting dressed, bedtime, and diaper change. Is anyone willing to share a verbal guidance strategy related to this picture of cleaning up in the classroom where we're giving children a choice, but we're still kind of managing that cleanup transition time of day? Um, in that picture, you can see how like one girl is has like the disinfectant that she is spraying and then a few other people have the paper towels of wiping on the table. It's like a choice you can give the children that are like, do you want to spray down the tables or do you want to be someone who wipes the tables down and like you're getting what needs to be done, but they have a choice of like which part of the act of the cleaning that they want to do. Yes, definitely. And then you might also, I would imagine in most classrooms, we have multiple tables. So you could also relate it to, you know, do you want to clean this table first or that table first? But as you can see with both of these examples, either way, someone's going to spray down the tables, someone's going to wipe the tables and both tables are going to get clean. And that's what we're trying to achieve, you know? So um, we, children feel more in control of being expected to clean up the tables when they're, when it's presented like that. How about getting dressed, someone else? Maybe this is obvious, but just like having them choose between two shirts or something to wear. Sure. Or like whether they wanna start with shirt or pants. Yeah, I think those are both great examples. Um, and, you know, uh most of the time if you have picked out two things you're okay with the child wearing either one of them they pick whichever one they feel okay about it um, that idea of you know do you want to start with your pants or your shoes is also a, a totally appropriate choice um bedtime it's pretty obvious you know how we would build this into um that that bedtime routine what about diaper change does anyone have ideas because there's a pretty 
straightforward diaper change process. Um, so how might you offer choice when you think about diaper change routines? Maybe if there's um, different types of diapers, like different patterns or something that they have, um, you can also like, do you want dinosaurs or do you want like Elmo? Sure. Yep. And then even like I said, um, you know, we want to be building in that independence and ability to have self-help skills for young children, but you could offer, you know, like, do you want to pull your pants up today or am I going to be the one to pull your pants up today? Um, because that also, it, you know, it just, it puts the ball back in their court, gives them that, that uh, choice and sort of control over the situation. Um, especially if a child's having a hard time with that transition, you know, that's kind of a way to be playful and, and still get the job done. All right. This is something that you will need to know for the midterm. So I want you to pay particular attention to what an I message looks like and sounds like. It's a logical and an accurate reason for why you're asking a child to do something. Okay. And it's not because I said so, despite what your dads may have told you. Um, I'm just kidding. My dad said that to me a million times. Um, everyone's dad might not have, but that is not a solid reason for why we want children to do something. So the, the reason is typically based on safety, you know, relationship to other people or environment, whatever. Um, but the I message sort of sounds like um, when you rip the pages of our books, I'm not able to read the books to the class and not being able to read at group time makes me feel sad or bummed out, you know? Um, so I've said to the child, please don't rip your, you know, our books are for reading and handling gently. When you rip the books, here's what happens. So I describe the behavior, ripping the books. The concrete effect is then I'm not able to read the book to our class. And that makes me feel disappointed or bummed out. Um, if a child hits another child, you know, when you hit so, so and so that hurts him and it makes me worried for my friends or for your classmates or for Sam. Um, but the, the, the basic idea here is that you're describing the behavior, you're talking about the effect of the specific behavior that you've described, and then you've attached it to a feeling on the part of yourself or another. can pretty much be applied to any challenging behavior uh, as an explanation for why we want that behavior to not happen. <clears throat> and I think this slide pretty much, um, you know, it sort of summarizes a lot of what we've already talked about, but we're kind of leading into talking about rules. So what I wanna say here is, Rules and classroom limits, as I've already said, are, are there for protection of either one child, the group of children, or our classroom space. And so when you think about creating classroom rules, which is what we're about to talk about, it's important to make sure that they all relate to one of those ideas. Um, and then rules, just like guidance strategies, should be stated in the positive, and they should be consistent. You know, you don't want... Um, different rules for the morning than the afternoon or for inside and outside necessarily um, with regard to safety and things like that. I mean, most classrooms don't have very elaborate rules. They're kind of like, be safe, be helpful, you know, um, be, I don't know. Um, this, this classroom has quiet voices, raise your hand, have looking eyes, listening ears and sit. But those are very straightforward. Um, they're consistent every day, every time we come to circle, that's what children know they're expected to do. Uh, this is an example of playground rules. Look, wait for a turn, nice hands. I could make an argument that that one could be a little bit um, more specific. What does nice hands mean? 
um, listen, go feet first on the slide. That's very specific. We don't go down the slide on our stomachs or with our heads first, it's feet first. And there's a picture of the slide here. Um, and then climb near a teacher. So they've also got a picture of a teacher helping the child near the, the ladder slide. Um, another classroom, and this is sort of what I was just talking about with nice hands. Um, they, their second rule says we use gentle hands and words. That's a little bit more information for the child. Um, but their rules are we let all bugs and animals live, use nice words and gentle hands, I'm sorry, gentle words and hands, use our looking eyes to help stay safe, and we share and take turns. Um, both examples, though, are simple, clear directives. Um, I feel like I've probably already said that, except the key piece here is teaching the rules systematically. So the rules need to be available for children to see and refer to, especially effective when you see pictures of the children um, engaging and following the rules like we just saw on the slide with outside rules. Um, but teaching the rules systematically, what do you think that means? How might we accomplish that? In one-on-one -on -one situations, when a child is struggling with the rules, we might remind them, these are our classroom rules. Um, but we would also introduce these rules. We would probably draft these rules together during our morning meeting or circle time. And then we would review these systematically and periodically so that everyone in our classroom is on the same page about what are the expectations of how we behave together in this space. Um, that's what's meant by teaching the rules systematically. And some of what we did last time with, you know, what would you teach and how would you teach it relates back to this. We would have clear expectations for how we behave at different times of the day, and then we would draw on those in, you know, different circumstances as needed. <clears throat> um, there's another idea on this slide to provide feedback on the rules. So as children are learning the rules, you would make sure to reinforce when they are following the rules, and then you can kind of scale that back as we all settle in um, to the classroom routines and kind of the flow of the day as the year progresses. But at the beginning of the year, that's really important to notice when you see children following the classroom rules that you've established. <clears throat> um, so another verbal guidance strategy um, involves problem solving or conflict resolution techniques. This is really the work that we want children to be doing in early childhood is learning how to do it differently and how to be more successful next time if something doesn't work. Um, so teaching that to children is really important. We can help children by evaluating situations with them. So three key questions that you might ask is, is something safe? Is it fair? And does it make you or your classmate feel good feelings? Um, those are three kind of basic ideas that can help children learn to evaluate a situation. Um, and then we wanna help them think through alternative solutions, you know? So um, the idea here is that if you're trying to share in blocks and taking the block that so-and-so was using, you know, creates conflict or is upsetting to that person, then that solution didn't work. And we need to think about another approach to getting the block that you want. And so, um, there are, this is from the CEPL, which is like the Center for Emotional and Social, I don't know what the F stands for off the top of my head, I apologize. Um, but it's an organization that is geared towards supporting social and emotional development with children. It's CES Foundational Learning, maybe, FL. Anyway, if you Google it, you'll, you'll come up with it. Um, but Cephal has developed what they call a solution kit. And these pictures are, are taken from that solution kit. 
Um, and in a lot of classrooms that I've worked in, we, you might see like a little box, a little Rubbermaid box with a lid and a handle. It's often in that quiet area thinking space where children can go to calm down, um, but it is full of possible solutions and those include what's listed here. So um, you might get an adult's help, ask nicely, ignore a behavior, you can play together, you can ask a child to please stop, say please, trade and take turns, wait your turn, um, or share, play together. Those are all solutions that can help a child manage that interpersonal conflict related to you know, sharing space and materials. Um, I have another little clip here, um, and this is a demonstration of a teacher, yes, foundation, so center on the social and emotional foundations for early learning, that's what CEPHL stands for. Um, and so this video is coming from CEPHL, but it shows a teacher kind of using this in action. We'll watch it really quickly. What solutions did you try? Well, it looks like you tried to take it from him. Was that a good solution? That's right. You tried to take it and he didn't give it to you. And it looks like you maybe got hurt a little bit. So is that a very good solution? Yeah. So what do you what do you think you should try next? Okay, Okay, try that one. Oh man, that's such a good solution. And he still said no. He's making it tough on you, Marisha. What else can you do? Okay, try that one. Wait, Frankie, just a minute. What did he say? You tried two really good solutions and he still said no. You are such a good problem solver. What else could you try? Where can we find more solutions at? What is that thing that Maggie had? Do you remember? What did Maggie have? She had that big suitcase. What was that? Maggie. Maggie had that. What did she have? The solution kit. Should we get the solution kit? Do you know where the solution kit is, Jordan? Anthony, do you know where the solution kit is? Can you go grab it for us? We've got a case for the solution kit. Buddy, that was very helpful. All right, Larisha. Open it up. Which one? You really want to play with that car? Wait and take turns. That one, you would have to be so strong, Larisha. This one says you would have to wait and wait and be so strong and wait until he was done with it. You'd have to go find something else to play with and then when he was done, come have a turn. Now, I don't know, this one you have to be really strong for. Can you do that one? You want to see what that one is? That one says share. Try sharing, did that one work? It's a good solution, but he didn't want to share. That one says trade. So you could say, you could say, hey, Jordan, do you want to use this mask? And then I can use the car. He's, is he making it tough on you? Yeah. He's making it tough on you, Larisha. Well, Larisha, this is the only one we haven't tried yet. That's right. Wait and take turns. Should we do that? All right. Let's go play over here, okay? When he's ready, we'll have a turn with the car, okay? Uh, and so I, I can tell you from my experience as a teacher and as an administrator that I have seen these solutions be super effective with children. Um, and sometimes just for the purpose, I mean, Sometimes the reason that it works is because the teacher is engaged with the child long enough to kind of diffuse the conflict as she's talking through the possibilities of the solution. 
but you also, I, I hope you noticed that um, another little fellow went and got the solution kit for them. So that's an opportunity to, you know, have children sort of take on a leadership or helpful role in the classroom um, to help remind children that this is a tool we can use when we have trouble with a classmate um, to kind of navigate how to come up with alternatives. Um, so again, that's called the solution kit. And it doesn't have to be the Cephal, you know, kit or cards, but that idea of giving children uh, concrete ways to work out their problems promotes that problem solving that we're trying to get at. All right, we're, uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about in terms of physical and verbal guidance. So we're shifting gears here at the end of class to sort of reflect on the readings that you had about praise, um, encouragement versus praise. So there are some ideas on this slide that give you um, kind of the distinction between what's what. Um, and we read about possible pitfalls of, of using praise. Um, it can lower children's confidence. It can kind of reduce their intrinsic motivation um, because it is more of an extrinsic reward. Uh, did anyone have any standout takeaways from either um, the reading on positive verbal environments or stop saying you're so smart? I think this reading really just kind of reinforces most of what we've talked about today, um, especially speaking courteously to children, that respectful tone. Um, and then I think asking a variety of questions, uh, specifically, you know, that's how we kind of effectively teach children, you know, to, to think more deeply about whatever they're doing in their play. But it can also relate to like problem solving strategies like what we just talked about, um, asking questions that help children kind of discover the answers on their own. And then uh, this, the stop saying you're to, so smart article, there were three points in there. Uh, the third one, though, was stop using praise altogether. What do you guys think about that? I just get kind of, um, I like I, I for the most part I I agree with the praise and encouragement. I think when you hear people go, like, oh my parents never told me they were proud of me and it made me like, or like I did good jobs and it made me feel like I I just didn't know if I was secure in myself and I'm just like wondering if it's like if encouragement can be phrased in a way that still does that for kids because I think like knowing you do a good job is important. Or it's just I misread it. I don't know. No, I agree. I'm, and so I think the key there is encouragement versus praise, right? And the and the two readings um, give us really clearly an idea that number one, praising the person is not what we want to do. We want to praise the process, and we want to recognize effort and um, you know. Uh, like engagement, attention to what you're doing, but not necessarily, oh, you're such a good puzzler. You did, you know, you did the hardest puzzle in the box or on the shelf um, because that sets children up to kind of think differently than if we say, wow, you worked so hard to get that puzzle done. And that was a really difficult one. That must have you know, I mean, and so you're, you're focusing more on the process of staying engaged and working through a challenge rather than you're such a good puzzler or you're so good at this. Um, and so it's really about praising the process and not praising the person. Um, and then I think the biggest thing that we're trying to avoid is that glossy, just like, good job. Wow. Great work. You know, that, that doesn't mean anything. Um, and I think 
you know, we live in a culture of, of likes. <laughs> um, everyone's doing it for the likes and, and we don't want that to be the child's experience in their classroom um, or in life in general. You know, we don't want them to be doing anything for the feedback that they get from other people, but because it feels good inside. Um, and so kind of drawing their attention to that, I do think is important, you know, to draw their attention to how does that make you feel when you work hard at something. So yeah, I think as long as we're conscious of how we're praising the process and not the child and focusing on the right things, I definitely think it, you know, it has a place. Um, and so uh, think encouragement, not praise. I have some examples of, um, let me, get back to where I want to go. I have some examples of different scenarios and I, I'll, I'll give you one and then maybe somebody would be willing to um, try their hand at, it's kind of like the reframing when we talked about thinking about children's behavior differently, but this is going to help us reframe praise into more of a, an encouragement statement. So Carmen helped set the table for lunch in the classroom. Praise sounds like, wow, what a good helper you are, Carmen. And encouragement sounds something more like, thank you for helping us set the table for lunch. You placed a spoon beside every bowl, so now everyone has what they need. You see the difference? You're such a good helper versus here's what you did to help us. Um, so here's one from a, like a home setting. Tommy helped pick up trash that had blown into the front yard. You might say, wow, Tommy, you're the best helper in our family. That's praise, right? What's a way that you could encourage the behavior instead of praising it? Just basically thank him for specifically what he did. Thank you, Tommy, for helping us clean up our yard. Now, you know, we don't have litter in the in the grass or whatever. Uh, praise sounds like you two played so nicely together. Encouragement is, wow, that's a really, you know, beautiful castle that you and Jimmy built. Um, you get the point. Would it be bad to say like, like, I love how nicely you two are playing. Like, it's not really like praising them specifically, but like saying like, oh, I love to see that. Like, would that still fall under the category of praise, you think? I think it's close. I think if you could notice specifically what they were doing, it would be more in line with what we're trying to see. Because, and the only reason that I say this is, you know, if that's kind of the tendency of the adults in the classroom, oh, you guys are playing really nicely together, it just becomes chatter, you know, and they don't necessarily, it's just like when people say walking feet, walking, like walking feet, every, everyone's say, saying it all day long and no one's listening to it anymore, you know, that's, that's kind of how I feel about that phrase. Um, because it's just, it just kind of blends into the goings on of the classroom if it's used in that really commonplace type of way. So, you know, if it were two children that absolutely never played together and you were like, wow, you and you and so-and-so played together for 20 minutes, you might notice that because it's kind of outside the box. But I think if you can focus on the behaviors of the children, um, specifically what they were playing or what they created would be the best. <sighs> um, for some reason, my computer is not doing things. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so the take home message that I just want you to leave with in regards to verbal guidance is that we want it to be responsive rather than restrictive. Um, again, this is a lot about tone and kind of the emotional approach to what we're saying, but responsive communication with children is respectful. It's coming from a place of caring. It encourages two-way communication. So again, we're not just talking at children, but we're also listening to them. Um, and then it offers choice alternatives, and it very clearly gives reasons or explanations why 
most of the time related to safety or caring for other people and the environment. On the flip side of that, restrictive verbal guidance is usually coming from a different place philosophically. It's rude, it's critical, it's an attempt to control children. We are not trying to promote autonomy and independence when we are restrictive. We're trying to tell children what to do. It often involves lecturing and um, submission to authority rather than, you know, connection with one another, with our space, et cetera. So really, um, sometimes it's not even what you say, but it's like how you feel in your heart when you say it <laughs> that comes across to the child. You know, sometimes the language can be exactly the same, but the message comes across totally different based on whether or not we're being responsive or restrictive. Um, there are some ideas here for reframing language. So if this is something that you feel like you need practice with or would like to get more practice with, you can work through this on your own time. Um, but it's just offering you some of those kind of negative directives where we're telling the child like stop running. And then the goal is for you to think about how you might say that um, in a more appropriate positive guidance way. All right, there is no additional content for this week because remember the midterm is Thursday. So if before you hop off the call, you will type your name into the chat and then between now and um, next Tuesday, make sure you access the documents we talked about at the beginning of class, complete your midterm and that will take us into next week. I'll be on for a few more minutes if anyone has questions or needs to chat. Um, otherwise, I will see you guys next Tuesday. Okay. Have Thank nice you. Week. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too.